Good afternoon. It is indeed my pleasure to welcome you to uh, our the Center for Online and Continuing Education's professional development session for today. We have with us uh, Christy Padron, who is the Scholarly Communications Coordinator for the FAU Library and also holds the, the position of an Associate University Librarian with the library. And, uh, and you are in for a lot, a lot, a lot of amazing information. So I am with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Christy. Thank you so much for joining us today. All right, thank you for the welcome, Judy. Uh, it's good to be here to talk about copyright with everyone today. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen in just a moment. All right, the, today's presentation is copyright information for faculty and instructors. I'll go over the objectives with you in just a moment. Just as a quick disclaimer, here's where I say, I'm not a lawyer and I cannot inter interpret the law and neither can my colleagues. And also to say that this information provided is for educational purposes only and does not substitute for advice from legal counsel. However, we still have a lot of good information to pass along. Today's objectives will be to outline some basic facts about copyright. Then we will identify some best practices and guidelines for copyright and their considerations. So we'll go over some of these things you've probably heard about, like you can copy so many pages and pass it out in class and things like that. Those are known as best practices and we'll describe what those are and some current ones that are out there today. And then finally, we'll wrap it up by describing some authoritative sources of information on copyright to inform your teaching and instructional practice. So we'll begin with some copyright basics with the definition and also describe what kind of work you get copyright protection, what rights do you have over your work and the protections that is provided. So a definition of copyright from the US Copyright Law Office are the legal protections and rights for creators who make an original work in a fixed medium. So what I do here is I kind of emphasize like a certain part of the definition. So when they say an art of original work, what can get protection? Well, it could be a literary work. So it could be a book, a book of poetry. Literary works can also apply to computer code too, according to current interpretation of the law. Musical works like composition, lyrics can also get copyright protection. And then dramatic works like plays, screenplays can also do it as well as dance moves like pantomimes and choreographic works. Pictorial, graphic, and cultural works can also get copyright protection. So the pictures that you take, those are yours. You have the copyright protection for that. Graphics and even cultural works like say patterns, like say like what a tribe may wear in a Native American powwow with their regalia, for instance. And as we know, motion pictures and other audiovisual works like CDs can also get copyright protection and then sound recordings and architectural works. So those are what the Copyright Office currently deems as an original work. The other part I wanna emphasize in the definition is fixed medium, which is defined as a work in a tangible form. This is something that you could taste, touch, and smell more or less. Now, intangible things cannot get a copyright. And what do I mean by intangible? Well, things like ideas on their own, they cannot. Facts cannot get copyright protection either. So a mathematical equation by itself cannot get, a, get copyright protection. If I discovered a planet, I cannot own copyright for it because it's, uh, it's a fact, so to speak, uh, not necessarily something I created, it was already there. I could put my name on it, but that's different. Measurements, processes, principles, and discoveries are also things that cannot get a copyright. And the third part I emphasize are the rights for creators that the law gives. So whether you create a work or someone else creates a work, these are the rights that they have over it. Someone can reproduce their work or they could make copies of it and they could also give it away, just like this paper boy. They could also make derivative works of their copyright. So if I were to write a book, I could also write a screenplay based on my book that I wrote. So I have the right as a copyright holder if I wrote a book and uh, I can make a derivative work of it. 
a person with a copyright could also display the work or perform the work publicly. So it could be their art exhibit, their images, their graphics, or it could even be their music or their dance moves. And then for sound recordings, copyright protection gives creators the right to perform their work on digital means. So they could stream it on Pandora or post it on YouTube or on a podcast. And then the legal protections really are going to be found in the current copyright law of the United States. As you can see on the left side, that's going to be the uh, book, but it is freely and openly available online through the government uh, copyright.gov website. In this very thick book, you get the legal definitions of copyright and also the exceptions. Exceptions are basically rights that people have to use a copyrighted work without asking for permission. So that's the legal, legal uh, word for things that let you do things with copyrighted works without permission, known as an exception. Copyright is actually automatically granted when a work is in tangible form. So the moment that I put pen to paper or type the words out on my word processor and it's finished, my screenplay or my book will have a copyright and it's mine automatically. Now registration is not necessarily mandatory per se, but it is recommended for legal purposes. So if I feel somebody infringes on my work uh, and it's, or it's too similar to mine, registering my copyright is recommended so I could take legal action against someone. Or if I wish to make money off my book or use it for commercial purposes, then registration is also recommended. But otherwise, registering your work is not absolutely mandatory. Copyright is held by a copyright owner and it can be shared or transferred. So as I mentioned, I wrote a book, but I can transfer the copyright to say a publishing house who will make sure it gets to a bigger audience than say Amazon, you know, self-publishing would. A copyright can also be shared. So if I co-wrote the book with a colleague, we would basically divide the copyright between us. Now, copyright law does have a term or a length of time where it has protections, and it depends on three things. The type of work is going to impact how long a work has a copyright protection. So a music is going to have a slightly, may have a different length of time where it has copyright protection than an image would. The year that a work was created will also have impact on how long copyright protection may be. Right now, the rule of thumb for copyrighted work is if I were to write my book this year, the copyright would be good for the rest of my life plus 70 years. So if I only live five more years, and let's not hope not, uh, let's hope it's better than that. <laughs> it will, my copyright protection will actually span 70 more years past that. And then also the country where a creator was when, when a copyrighted work was created will also impact where it was. Uh, so whether somebody was a visiting scholar in Australia, they might have slightly, and, and wrote a book while they were there, they might have slightly different uh, copyright protection terms than they would if they stayed in America and did the book. So as far as interpreting and applying copyright for instruction, this is the tricky part. It is law and copyright decisions are almost never a yes or no answer. Instead, it really depends on a lot of different things. So like I said, it's law subject to interpretation and then we as practitioners and scholars will apply it to whatever it is we do. But the answer to copyright questions and decisions will usually depend on these factors, the work itself. So let's just say you want to um, have your students read a chapter of a book. OK, well, uh, the work itself is going to impact it. Like when was it published? If it's a book that's in the public domain and no longer has copyright protection, well, you're not. That's going to be a pretty easy answer. But if your work still has copyright protection, OK. When was it published? Because like I said, the years impact how long a work has copyright protection. So little details about a work are going to influence uh, your copyright scenario. The details of use will also impact your question. So you want your going back to the case of where you want your students to read a chapter. Well, is it going to be a chapter that you want to have them access through Canvas, through a digital ebook? 
or is it a scanned copy from your own personal book that you have? So the details of your use are really going to depend, uh, I mean, are really going to impact a copyright question. The case law is something else too. Now, I'm not recommending, I'm not saying you have to go out and find all the authoritative case law and copyright, but case law is very helpful for understanding how the courts interpret copyright at this time, because that is subject to change over time. And then finally, your risk tolerance will also impact how you make a copyright decision. Some people who feel very comfortable with their knowledge of copyright may be a little more open. Oh, yes, I could do this. Yes, yes. But you've got a lot of people who are also very afraid of a lawsuit or a publisher getting after them or getting a, a, an infringement claim. And some people will just do just almost never use copyrighted works in their instruction and teaching practices. So copyright decisions are really going to depend on a combination of these four things. And even if um, even if an attorney were to talk to you about it, he or she would ask you these four questions and refer to case law, and then they would advise you appropriately. Now, in terms of copyright and instruction, educators rely very heavily on fair use, which is an exception in the US copyright law. It allows you to reuse copyrighted materials for limited teaching, research, scholarly, or creative activities. So copyright gives uh, copyright holders rights over their work um, to kind of like benefit them for their creation. They can get financial uh, reward and esteem for it. And people just can't go out and just copy whatever and not give them credit or payment for, for use. But fair use is a part of copyright law that does allow teachers to reuse um, these materials in limited ways or copy them in limited ways without the permission of a copyright holder. Fair use applies for limited purposes and also transformative purposes. What does that mean exactly? Well, I could get, uh, let's see, a book like Huckleberry Finn. You know, fair use gives me the right to talk about Huckleberry Finn and write about it in a scholarly article. So if I want to do like, a, I have an interpretation of Huckleberry Finn, fair use gives me the right to talk about it and, and publish about it, but I'm not necessarily you know, copying Mark Twain's work. I'm just taking it and talking about it and commenting on it. Fair use also gives me the right to talk about it in news. So if I have a podcast, I could talk about the Adventures of Huckleberry Finn on my podcast. And, um, you know, I, I can't get, nobody can really go after me for copyright infringement or it's, or, you know, if I'm just talking about it. And then even parody, fair use does allow us to make fun of a copyrighted work in a way. Uh, you're probably familiar with this case that went to the Supreme Court, the South Florida rap group, Two Live Crew, did a parody of Roy Orbison's Oh Pretty Woman. So they went all the way to the Supreme Court because Roy Orbison's music publisher sued Two Live Crew and said, hey, you can't do that. But Two Live Crew and their attorneys gave a very convincing argument where the Supreme Court said, yes, they can. So fair use does allow copyrighted works to be used for transformative purposes where you take a copyrighted work and you do something a little differently with it. All right. So going over what we just discussed here, I have three scenarios we could briefly think about and talk about. The first one is us. Professor Proficient has a great idea for a process and wants to get a copyright for it. What are some things she will need to do for it to get copyright questions? Okay, so Ms. Keller says, Mr. Ms., I'm sorry, I can't see, but says write it down. Okay, yes, it has to be made permanent, says Michael Brady. So first she would have would have to write it down or document it somehow or make it in a tangible form. So that's going to be the very first thing she has to do for copyright protection. Now the second one has to do with the student. Sammy's student created a cool image for the cover of his upcoming self-produced music CD. Maybe he did something with Owl Records. I should have added that. Should Sammy apply for a copyright for the image? What do you think Sammy should do? Or what would you suggest to Sammy? And just based on what we've talked about so far. 
So Michael Brady says, register the image. Yes. I mean, if, if I'm going to assume Sammy wants to sell his CDs and maybe get them to a producer who can distribute them. So yeah, I mean, if Sammy wants to sell his CDs, he might want to uh, do that. And then especially if, if it, his work is that good, uh, he'll want to have copyright protection for it. So have rights over the work. So yes. So third scenario, Penny, your best friend Sugar Glider is an Instagram star. Now that Penny has amassed thousands of pictures and followers, you suggest merchandising Penny's images. What would you tell your friend about copyright to start? Wow. And in case you're wondering, the sugar glider is a marsupial <laughs> and it's about this big. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so what would we tell Penny about copyright to start? She, well, since you know, your friend owns Penny, she has rights over Penny. Uh, your friend, assuming your picture, your friend took all the pictures of Penny themselves, they own the copyright. But I think it's pretty similar to the Sammy student scenario where Penny's picture should probably, the images should probably be um, registered if she wants to merchandise it. You know. Um, yeah. If she wants to claim it as a thing, then she should create it as a picture book. Yeah, so if she wants to make a picture book or something like that, or a calendar or t-shirts or stuff like that. So. so Penny would qualify as a tangible object? Her pictures would, yes. <laughs> yes she would. Okay, here was a real life copyright scenario. A photographer, I think somewhere in Africa or Asia, put his camera down someplace and an animal scurried up to the picture and press the button and you have a picture of this animal peering into the camera and as it turned out the photographer did not own the copyright because the animal itself can't really have copyright so <laughs> but so this is a true copyright story this this photographer took a really well this camera took a picture you know and, and it, i love it <laughs> yeah all right, so uh, did anybody have any questions so far in the presentation? I could field some some basic questions on what we covered. If you have questions about your copyright use, specific copyright uses, um, we could either finish those to the end or I can contact you directly about about your questions. If you have like, you know, can I use this in my class kind of question. Okay, so now in this part, I will go over some best practices and guidelines to go into an explanation of what they are and some current best practices that you could lean on to possibly answer and inform a lot of your copyright questions. Raise your hand if you heard it's okay to do the following with books or articles for your class or teaching. And for those of you who've been teaching for a long time, you could probably attest to hearing some of these. You've heard that you can use a certain percent of a work's content, like say, let's assume 10% of a book. Let's just say you could use a certain number of pages of a work, like maybe in a book or a work. Or maybe you can have a certain number of copies of the above to pass out in class. Even as a student teacher, I, heard, I would hear these things like 20 plus years ago. Um, and, and and I hear, I get that question a lot as a librarian, can I use X number of pages for uh, class? Now these certain amounts are or were recommendations of various professional groups. They were groups that would use copyrighted works for educational purposes like school, media, specialists and teachers, and, and of course, college level instructors and professors. Now, these best practices were attempts to minimize the guesswork for copyright questions because they understand we don't have uh, law degrees and we really wanted to know what we could do and probably should not do in a class and for instructional purposes. But they are not the same as current copyright law. I just wanted to kind of give you that heads up about the various best practices that you've probably heard. And also that some of these may be outdated or may not apply, especially uh, on the details of your use. Like for instance, 1976 was when a lot of these, um, these 
best practices were made, and that was back in the day when there was there was no digital. Everything was mimeographed. I, I, I that was a little before my time, or photocopied. Uh, so a lot of I was really surprised to hear how many people still use the amounts from those days. So some of these are, are outdated. But I can assure you at least though that experts state that organizational best practices do have some good points and there are some current ones that are out there that I could recommend to you in a moment. Um, let me just pause on that point. A lot of these best practices were created by various organizations that use copyrighted works for instruction and scholarly or creative purposes. And they did work with attorneys who are experts in intellectual property and copyright law on these things. However, experts do recommend to know some copyright fundamentals. So knowing the definition of a copyright, and the kinds of protections it offers is always a good thing, um, especially when you have to decide on using the copyrighted work in a scenario that doesn't fall within the lines of the best practice. So uh, the visual arts may have a recommendation for showing images for teaching purposes, but well, you're, you want to do it online or you want to do it um, on a live presentation or something like that. And sometimes the best practice scenario might not adequately address that or fully. Address it. Now, there are some best practices on fair use of, uh, of different types of formats. The Visual Resources Association does have its statement of fair use of images for teaching, research, and study. And that's its URL there. And I can give you, we can make these slides available to you if you want those. Uh, We'll, we'll yeah. tell you about that. Yeah. The visual, the College Art Association has a code of best practices and fair use for visual arts. And then I think something that we all want to know about are the code of best practices for fair use for online video. So for the Center for Media and Social Impact has a variety of best practices for using media in classrooms or for teaching purposes. So that could be a really good guideline, or at least give you some initial uh, guardrails, so to speak, on what you can do, especially with online video. And even disciplines may have uh, best practices, like the Documentary Filmmakers Association has a statement of best practices that's been done by a variety of uh, motion picture and filmmaking associations. And even we librarians have our own code of best practices. We look at course materials a lot, and sometimes we have to make copies of things that are damaged or about to be damaged or in really bad shape. So we do have a statement for ourselves. But definitely take a look at the cmsimpact.org webpage for other codes of best practices. They may include media studies, journalism, and poetry, and also open education resources. So definitely take a look at these pages for some current uh, best practices on using various copyrighted materials. Guidelines are also available too. The Copyright Clearance Center is an organization that grants permissions for using copyrighted good materials for teaching purposes or even scholarly publishing purposes too. Their webpage provides a lot of guidance, especially which may be most relevant to you all, our course packs. Definitely take a look at what they recommend for using copyrighted items on learning management systems. So they up those fairly regularly. And then, of course, digital content, like what do they have to say about things like streaming video, ebooks, or things you find online, and then distributed and making photocopies. So this is the CCC, also known as the Copyright Clearance Center, where you can visit to get some of their guidelines that do really address the needs of educators and instructors. So next I'll go into some copyright information sources that are available for you all. I'll focus on the library guides, soon to be called research guides here in the library, and then some authoritative sources on copyright information that you could get. Now, copyright is really not a plug and play concept. And as I mentioned earlier, possible answers to copyright questions usually begin with, it depends. Now, there's a lot of copyright information on the internet, but what I found is that the sites tend to scratch the surface or they may be very outdated. So I always mention, you know, how we used to fall back on, well, I could make X number of copies for my class. I could do this, you know, the information that was based on very old 
you know, or previous information. So that's one pitfall I found when I've done my own copyright information searches and for my own copyright education purposes. So what I recommend, definitely use the sites to educate and inform yourself on copyright matters. Take a look at the responsible organization for the site and its authors. So kind of like how we tell our students to always look at the source and think about who wrote it. Well, you know, the same goes for the copyright pages. Take a look at its currency or when it was updated to make sure we've got the most recent current information. But also embrace the view that sites also have the legal disclaimer for educational purposes only. Kind of like what I'm doing today, they just want to give some information, but a lot of times uh, they will get copyright questions. Yes, can I do this? Can I do that? And they usually say, well, we just have this up for information, but we cannot give you advice, but we could tell you to go to an attorney. So that's something you'll probably consistently get if you're hoping for a very specific answer to a question. But at least we can provide you with where to start for this information. So the first one is the Copyright Library Guide here. Um, this is the short URL for my for this particular web page. It goes into more information about fair use. That is, how could you make a fair use analysis or determination? Then it will give you some basic information on public domain. What does that mean? And it's basically when copyrighted works no longer have copyright uh, protection because they've kind of aged out, so to speak, of that copyright term. I also have some information here about how you can find a copyright holder. So let's just say for your scholarly work, you wish to quote significant, okay, not chapters, hopefully not, but you want to quote quite a bit of work in your work because it helps you make a point or support your point. Well, how can you find the copyright holder to get permission to do that? And then we also have a little page about how you could request permission from someone to reuse their work. The Copyright Law of the United States is published by the US Copyright Office, and this link will take you directly to the laws um, the U.S. Copyright Office also provides a lot of information. I find a lot of people may get a little frustrated with it because it may be a little dense, but it does provide a lot of current information. Its circulars give a lot of good information on the applications of copyright law, especially certain things like the TEACH Act, international copyright, and especially fair use. The U.S. Copyright Office site also includes information on how to register your work and also how to find copyrights for works. Now, we there are some really authoritative sources on copyright for the public written in slightly more or more layman's terms. The Stanford University Library has a really good overview of copyright and fair use. This uses content by Richard Stim. You've probably heard of a no low legal publications. They're kind of like do it yourself guides to various aspects of the law. And it legally reuses his content. I believe he's with the Stanford University Law School and other experts who write about, who write about legal topics, but for the public use. The Cornell University Library's Copyright Information Center also has a lot of good information. Here's where you can also make a determination on when a work is in the public domain. And then to go into copyright for teaching and instruction purposes, we have a separate library guide available for you all so that you can see what does classroom use exception allow you to do? What does digital millennium copyright mean? Uh, creative Commons, we, sh we give you some sources of where you can find Creative Commons works. So these are items, although they still have copyright protection, Creative Commons is a license that someone sticks on and allows people to use it for certain things without permission, and as long as it falls within the terms of use. Okay, so Creative Commons is one I hadn't mentioned. You can go directly to the creativecommons.org site to learn about what those works are and explain the license. And then the Copyright Clearance Center, which I showed you with the guidelines, also has a lot of information too, especially about how to get copyright permission for reusing some works. They also have a resource library full of information about copyright. All right, so before I field any questions, 
You can go to our library website, bit.ly forward slash SCS dash FAU to go over our scholarly communication services offered for the campus community. We offer our services online as well as face to face and for all FAU campuses. And you could also contact me through the scholarly com at FAU.edu if you have questions about copyright. I also wanted to let you know that we do provide consultations where you can discuss your use and considerations. I really cannot give you yes or no questions, but we can think about the details and some possibilities about what you could do. And then you can go from there to make your decision on your work. We could also do presentations for your departmental meetings, groups, courses, and events. I have provided library instruction for a very long time on how to show people how to use a library. Well, we still do that, but now we also can provide information about copyright for students if you feel they need to learn about that. And then we also offer some learning objects like our library guides can be mini lessons and we do provide a variety of short recordings and self grading quizzes for assignments if you feel your students would really benefit and your course objectives would really benefit from having this information. Okay, it looks like Ivana Sarah wants to know how does fair use apply to copyrighted images from the internet used in lecture PowerPoints. So I'm assuming somebody's using copyrighted images that they find on the internet and want to use them. Um, let's see. That that's kind of a multi layered question, but I'll approach the very first one. First is uh, where the uh, where did the images originally come from? Like what? Like did somebody post an image on the on the internet with the permission of the copyright owner or not without it? So it's very possible that the things that we see on the internet were shared without the um, permission of the copyright owner. Um, so. You could you might be able to get away with the fair use assertion to say, well, I'm just using it for teaching purposes. And from an ethical perspective, you can kind of see it as well, but am I respecting the copyright holder? But on the flip side, it's kind of like, well, but it is for teaching purposes only. So that's kind of like I said, you know, it's not a yes or no question. It's going to be a really dis it depends. Um, and the other part of it too is that, well, what do we want our students to know about reusing the intellectual property of others? We do, they do actually listen and go by our role, our, our um, example more than we think. So um, I know of some professors who make their students cite the copy, cite the images that students use in the um, PowerPoints. Um, I personally use stock photos. There are some internet sites like pixabay.com and Unsplash where um, they allow people to reuse it without having to ask for permission. Sometimes they may say, please cite me or attribute me. Some say, no, you don't have to. But I would say probably the more ethically and legally safe way to go would be to use a stock photo um, from a free image site like Pixabay or Unsplash or to possibly use your own. Um, now, what now Ivana's use isn't a terrible, terrible bad thing, but part of it, you also have to think about the prop someone else's property and their efforts. I also wanted to show the slide here. Um, I do give a statement of my images that I used and where my source of where I got them. Um, Unsplash and Pixabay does allow me to reuse the site's um, images without permission as, as long as it's for limited uh, educational purposes and, and they don't require me to reuse it. Um, I see another question from Lisa Brown Bannock who asks who has the copyright to research products produced as a graduate student at FAU? That's an interesting question. What I can tell you right off the bat is, um, is there are FAU documents that define that. The rule of thumb is if it's done for an assignment by a student or a graduate student or for their thesis, the copyright's going to belong to them. However, if it is done for somebody else's research, like for students who are working in a lab, um, that or they're doing work for someone else, that's going to belong to the primary investigator. So graduates, the work of graduate students is theirs unless it's done for a project with the primary investigator. 
Um, so that and, and this isn't an interpretation. This is actually from an FAU um, rule and regulation. I can't think of it off the top of my head this moment, but um, but they do have statements about that. And I think the division of research and uh, oh gosh, I wish they're really good sources too. And some another source has that kind of information. Um, now, in terms of um, uh, what what copyright goes to what copyright for scholars is kind of a strange thing because technically by law FAU could own the outputs of scholars because we're doing it on FAU's payroll but guess what by norm that's not how it works because higher ed you know they don't want to be busy trying to pay attention to copyrights of the hundreds and if not thousands of papers that faculty have published while at FAU so generally how it works is that our scholarly outputs like articles and presentations and publications will belong to the scholar initially, you know, until they transfer them to a publisher, which usually happens. Um, however, um, instructional, certain instructional works belong to the faculty member too, and then certain things belong to uh, the university. It's the intellectual property policy of the FAU Division of Research that defines what faculty own. So that I can tell you for sure. And then also the FAU Faculty Handbook on Intellectual Property has it for faculty as well. And then for students, the FAU Catalog Academic Policies and Regulations have those. So those are the three documents that define most of the copyright work. And then Another question was, what are the repercussions if one inadvertently breaches copyright law and protection? Well, thankfully, if you're doing it in the line of work, they can't really do anything horrible to you. <laughs> but like, let's just say, but if you did something like showed an Amazon streaming show to your thousand student class on Canvas, you might have trouble there. But <laughs> if it's something little and inadvertent, then you know, they might not. So the, pre, the, the the worst you might get is like a cease and desist order, stop doing that. Um, but, and plus publishers and copyright holders know it's extremely bad practice to go after professors and colleges that they know, especially nowadays, don't have much money. So uh, we do have some protections, but it's just don't blatantly do things seems to be the name of the game. So if you'd like more on copyright, on Monday, November, October 11 at 12 to 1230, I'll be having a Zoom webinar, a crash course in copyright, the basics. Um, I'm pretty much going to be going over the first part of what I talked about here. But part two is something you might like called myths, facts, and fair use. That's going to be October 13, 2021, two days later. So you could register on Zoom for that. Um, this is geared to a student audience, which is why it's only half an hour. But if you'd like, you could use this webinar as an assignment or extra credit because I throw in a quiz and a self grading quiz um, certificate that will be sent to students if they pass it. And then that way they can have proof. So we do have some copyright webinars in October and the library will definitely be having their own webinars and we'll probably be working with COSI next, uh, next semester to continue yes. the conversation. Thank you so much, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much.